Okay, so today we're going to talk about pneumonia and the patterns and how to recognize that and come up with a differential diagnosis. So, um, the three major patterns are ground glass, consolidation, and nodular is broken down into small, two centimeters or less, large, greater than two centimeters, nodular, which is cavitary. Now, who knows what pattern this is? Somebody's backyard patio. So that's called crazy paving, okay? Whenever a radiologist uses the term crazy paving, you should have a diagnosis, okay? It's a form of ground glass pneumonia. In fact, this is crazy paving on an x-ray and a CAT scan, especially because it looks just like that, okay? It's a form of ground glass, and the classic diagnosis is interstitial fibrosis or pulmonary fibrosis, and that's crazy paving, and that's pulmonary fibrosis. That's what the lungs look like, and there's the pathophysiology behind it. Now, <clears throat> if you have, for your question, a patient who's 35, and they have ground glass pneumonia and they're progressively hypoxic over several weeks. So you finally do a bronchoscopy because various antibiotic trials, etc., didn't work. So you bronch them and the uh, fluid from the lavage is showing Mississippi mud, milky exudate. And based on that, the pulmonologist says, we suspect it's blah, blah, blah. So they run a PAS stain and it's floridly positive. So what would you say the likely diagnosis is? Right. Very good. PAP, pulmonary alveolar proteinosis, which is an abnormal buildup of surfactant. This is what it looks like under the electron microscope. And guess what? New England Journal of Medicine found out many of these people have a relative GM-CSF deficiency and they're using various meds to try to treat this. But for your question, the ultimate treatment is what that this t picture shows you. What do you think this picture is showing you? That's the treatment. You put them in the operating room and you do what? Serial lavage. You basically pulmonary toilet, clean out their lungs and you may have to do that several times. Now, a lot of these people wind up on steroids and then they show up with nodules in their lung and nodules in their brain and that is supposed to be what infection? No cardiosis. Thank you. Okay. So, remember, PAS stain positive. That's the key. Okay. Now, <clears throat> crazy paving, by the way, can be all these possibilities. Okay. Very, just like ground glass pneumonia. So, there's a lot of possibilities. But... Classically, you want to think of interstitial pneumonia, fibrosis, but other things can do it too. Now, I throw this in because I see this every now and then in about one in a few hundred CAT scans, x-rays. I saw this strange structure here, and I'm wondering, what is that? And finally, a radiologist told me, what is it? It's the hemiazygous fissure, and you're looking at the hemiazygous vein. If it's on the other side, it's the azygous fissure. So it's just a strange, normal anomaly that has no relevance to anything. And there you have another CAT scan with the same that problem in a different patient. And there you have it verbally, what you just saw, okay? Now, let's get into the meat of the matter, which is ground glass pneumonia. A lot of people ask me, what does ground glass mean? Well, that's ground glass. It means I can see the fingers, but it's blurry. So if I put that into a lung situation, it means I can see blood vessels, but I can't see other structures very clearly. Okay, so that is a ground glass pneumonia on a chest x-ray. Used to call it interstitial, prominence, whatever. This is a geographic ground glass pneumonia where you have some relatively normal areas and then you have the ground glass. So that makes you come up with different diagnoses as well. So all that is now summarized in this. Uh, you can read on your own afterwards. Pathophysiologically, 
the structure of the lung is intact, but the uh, alveoli interstitial area is thickened. Now, here's the most important part of the whole talk, which is, okay, if I see that, what is my differential diagnosis? Well, number one is community-acquired respiratory viruses, so you order a respiratory viral panel. In the right population, CMV, so you may have to order a PCR CMV or in the lavage, but not that common, not every patient. HHV6, extremely rare, but it has been reported. PCP, yes, but we need a bronch to do that. And if I want to diagnose PCP, possibly by a blood test, I would order. Uh, that gets you a little closer, LDH, but not close enough. You want to order the beta-glucan, which can be positive for PCP. But obviously, we want to do the BAL, OK? Then you have the atypicals. Can you name the three atypical pneumonia bugs? It's Mycoplasma, Legionella, and Chlamydia which are also picked up in the restroviral panel, except not Legionella, so you have to order the urine antigen. Bordetella pertussis is in the restroviral panel, respiratory panel, so you can now pick that up by PCR. Boop, cop, that requires a lung biopsy. Diffuse alveolar hemorrhage, that has to be diagnosed by bronch. ARDS, trolley, transfusion-related acute lung injury, TACO, I don't know what it stands for, but it's after a transfusion. It's a little different than trolley. Uh, chemo, radiation, pulmonary edema. So you can see the gamut is quite large. Uh, if you like the idea of acute causes of ground glass pneumonia versus chronic, I will get you to the point of chronically, you want to think of hypersensitivity pneumonia, eosinophilic pneumonia, the alveolar protonosis, and then don't forget this one, be back bronchoalveolar carcinoma, okay? Now, this is consolidation. You cannot see blood vessels. That's on an x-ray. There's the CAT scan. That is a consolidation. And you can see air bronchograms, but you cannot see blood vessels. It's also called low bar pneumonia. And the histopathology looks like a liver. That looks like a liver. It's all, you know, just one big congestion, right? So when you think of low bar pneumonias or consolidation, you want to think of the community-acquired bacteria, the hospital-acquired bacteria in our immune-suppressed population, molds, nocardia, boop, just to name a few. Those can cause consolidation. And if you want a back-to-back -back comparison, ground glass consolidation, you can clearly see there is a difference. And now we get into nodules, less than 2 centimeter, yes. This is at Moffitt in a leukemic neutropenic. What's your differential? The answer is, number one is fusarium, especially prolonged. Number two could be cetosporium. And then in the right population, not necessarily Moffitt, but MRSA, endocarditis, septic emboli, and of course, Lemire syndrome can do it rarely, which is fusobacterium. And then in a more chronic subacute course, mycobacterium, avium complex, intracellulari, or rapidly growing mycobacterium. So those are the thoughts, okay, when you see nodules less than two centimeters. By the way, these are not hard and fast. There are some overlap, but this is generalities here. This is bigger than two centimeters. And then to describe it, you would say it's pleural based and it has a halo of ground glass. Again, it's a leukemic prolonged neutropenic that I'm talking about. So, in that population, the differential is molds, 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 occasionally nocardia, boop, cop, MRSA, gram-negative mycobacterium, real rare rhodococcus, and then cancer itself, especially lymphomas, look like that. So, now the fun begins. For your question, we have a 30-year-old female, leukemic fever, cough, wheezing, child at home is sick, key is the month of June, so we're in the summer. We have ground glass pneumonia. We have sinusitis. Which one is it? Correct. Parainfluenza. Which number? Three. Correct. Very good. For your question, we have a kid who can't breathe. He's and he's got what sign on his x-ray? It's a part of the church. What's it called? The steeple sign. Very good. Okay, so what does that mean? He probably has croup, which is parainfluenza with subglottic swelling, and that's what it would look like, right? Okay. Now, what is the treatment for your question of this scenario? It used to be 
steroids. Before that, it was steam. Then someone did a study. Steam, cold air found no difference. My opinion, it's steroids. If you read the literature now, it's epinephrine, okay, which is not an option there, okay? All right. Now, paraflu, ground glass pneumonia, and notice I got a new pattern for you. This is called centrilobular. It's central, it's lobular, and it's around the lobule, and it looks like almost like tree and bud. So when you use tree and bud, we think of mycobacterium avium complex. When you use centrilobular, we think of viruses, respiratory viruses, but of course the overlap is great, okay? And I'll explain that. Then those centrilobular areas can get semi-consolidated, but not quite always. So there is some overlap. And then it cleans up nicely. So what do you guys think we gave this person with paraflu pneumonia, failing ribavirin, steroids, and he was dying? What do you think we gave him? We gave him alpha interferon, cured the guy, he did great, and went home, and we published his case. Okay? Now... What about this case for your question? We have a 66-year-old Hodgkin's patient, transplant, congested, wheezing, progresses from upper to lower respiratory infection, winds up on the vent, ultimately dies three weeks later. It's the month of January. The flu screen is negative. And there's the ground glass. There it is progressing. And there's the sinusitis, which bug kills transplant patients in the winter. That's correct. Respiratory syncytial virus. CMV does not cause sinusitis. Okay? So, and CMV strikes year-round, not just in the winter, right? So this is RSV. Now, what is the newly discovered virus that mimics RSV on the list? That is correct. Metanumavirus, and the second one is Boca virus. It got its name not because Boca is mouth in Spanish, but because... It was in B.O., bovine, and C.A. cat, Boca virus. It's sort of like a parvovirus. It is not on the PCR respiratory panel, so you cannot diagnose it in many places, okay? Metanumavirus was discovered mostly in birds, and then ultimately they found out it was in humans causing RSV-like illness with bronchiolitis, and they ultimately discovered everybody has basically been infected with it and usually by the age of five, not just in the Netherlands, but worldwide. Okay, and then Boca virus is another newly discovered virus that can mimic RSV. Okay, for the next question, um, we're back at the beginning. 81-year-old leukemic, has pulmonary fibrosis, he's congested, he's short of breath, he's coughing. We find a DNA virus, and the treatment of choice was cydofavir. There's his ground glass, there's his sinusitis. So which drug bug causes sinusitis, pneumonia, and is treated with cydofavir, and it's a DNA virus? Just pick one. That's correct. Adenovirus is the correct choice. So what's the probability of a certain virus infecting a patient? Uh, paraflu is pretty high, especially winter time, and then occasionally summer with three RSV. Uh, rhino is always on your list. The flu I don't have coronavirus here. Most people say it's relatively benign. Another article says it can kill you in bone marrow patients. Metanumo is not as common, neither is adeno and boca. Don't really have a good way to detect it. So we're in the month now of July. So we're still in paraflu season and the rhinoviruses. And then the winter time, you can see the usual viruses. Uh, I like this. It was a recent... Um, picture over the years if you can see where in the seasons the viruses are most common you can see the paraflu in the summer and all the respiratory viruses in the winter time and how often you're going to find them you know like rhinovirus is very common uh, and then rsv is very common in the winter seasons and how they overlap okay for your question, we have a 28-year-old who has ground glass pneumonia. She has IgM hemolytic anemia, bullous meningitis, and she has erythema multiform. So she likely has what bug? That is correct. So she has mycoplasma. And 
notice it can give you a sentry lobular ground glass pattern similar to the respiratory viruses. And then when we say sentry lobular, here's the lobule central, that's that ground glass, which is very similar to tree and bud. Here's your lobule, and then here's your alveoli giving you that pattern. This is called sentry lobular in the middle there. And then remember, sentry lobular, think of respiratory viruses. And tree and bud, think of mycobacterium avium complex, classically. Okay, remember, mycoplasma, lots of extra pulmonary manifestations, and rarely it affects what part of your brain frequently. The cerebellitis can happen, as well as encephalopathy. Okay, and then summer, fall, peak with some pharyngitis, and there's all that outlined for you. Remember, it's IgM, not IgG, hemolytic anemia. Uh, cold agglutinins were a positive halftime, and now we have mycoplasma on our PCR respiratory panel. You don't have to rely on the inexact science of serology, IgG, and IgM. Okay, you get out of a hot tub, and you're now three days later on the vent, and it was acquired from the hot tub, and you were relatively elderly or immune suppressed. So what did you get from the hot tub? Hold that thought. So you do a direct fluorescent antibody, and it was positive, and then you're actually growing the organism on charcoal yeast extract. So your best guess is Legionella is the correct answer. So you want to think of Legionella in this setting. Uh, and remember the urinary antigen can be positive for up to 90 days, even after effective treatment. And usually you use a macrolide or quinolone. Now this person, um, for your question, got out of the hot tub and or they're um, pressure washing the mold off their driveway or roof and um, now um, they're short of breath hypoxic with ground glass pneumonia so what do you think they have that fast 24 hours they have a hypersensitivity pneumonitis to what bug mycobacterium avium complex or other mycobacterium okay Hypersensitivity pneumonitis treatment is steroids. These are all the things that give you hypersensitivity pneumonitis, okay? Now, for your question, what lives in your hot water heater, your shower head and pipes? And if you're a tall, thin, postmenopausal woman, you can get bronchiectasis and nodules in your lung. Yes, which mycobacterium? And it especially likes to give you bronchiectasis in the right middle lobe lingular area. Named after an Oscar Wilde play called Lady Windermere Syndrome, after a Victorian lady who coughed a lot when it wasn't ladylike to cough, so that's why they named it Lady Windermere Syndrome. And that's which mycobacterium? Avium intracellulare or complex, correct. Now, for your question, this same patient now, 20 years later, has worsening bronchiectasis and nodules, and the mycobacterium sputum culture is growing in three to five days. So your likely diagnosis is what? What grows in the world of mycobacterium in three to five days? A rapidly growing mycobacterium, which is Chelonii fortuitum abscessus and mazolensis, okay, but probably abscessus. It loves following MAI structural lung damage. It loves people with achalasia, and the combo antibiotics are quite limited. Okay, for your question, we have a patient with um, asthma, cough, wheezing, brown flecks coming up, Ig elevated eosinophilia and bronchiectasis. What's your likely diagnosis? ABPA, which stands for allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis. And there's your bronchiectasis from ABPA, right? Now, when you think of aspergillus lung infection, you got four possibilities. One, you got this asthma allergic phenomenon, treatment of steroids and maybe an azole against the aspergillus. Two, you got an aspergilloma, which is in a cavity. Cut it out. Occasionally give them vori, posa, crisemba. 
Uh, three, you got a COPD or on steroids with this slowly progressive cavitary nodular pneumonia, chronic necrotizing. Four, you got the leukemic bone marrow neutropenic with the angioinvasive rapidly spreading can disseminate four presentations. Okay, so remember the diagnostic criteria for ABPA asthma, eosinophilia, IgE elevation, and an antigen positive. And they can classify it one to five with mild to severe illness. Okay, um, for your question, we have a 20 year old with recurrent pneumonia that's always showing up in the right middle lobe. So your syndrome is what? It's the right middle lobe syndrome, okay? There is no such thing as a left lower lobe syndrome or a left upper lobe syndrome. So why is the right middle lobe have a syndrome? And I'll show you anatomically why that's true. So you can see it in kids, especially with ciliary problems, asthma, etc. You can see it in adults, cystic fibrosis, ciliary stuff, that's the kids. And then you can have it intra and extra luminal reasons to get occlusion of the right middle lobe, okay? And that is the intraluminal differential. Now, the causes could be the bugs you can isolate out of the right middle lobe are community-acquired bacteria such as, you know, strep pneumo. You could get mycobacterium ultimately, and you can get aspergillus ultimately, okay? And here's the idea. The right middle lobe has this direct access where aspiration can occur, and it has a long uh, bronchus leading into it that's easily kinked, et cetera. And so the right middle lobe has um, a syndrome. Okay, we're back to the beginning. We have a 20-year-old getting recurrent pneumonia, and over the last 15 years, his cultures have grown out from his spit, Pseudomonas, Burkholder, Isopatius, Stenotrophomonas, Staphylococcus, and Mycobacterium obsessus. So this is a concern for what? Unifying diagnosis. Right. CF stands for cystic fibrosis. So this is a list of bugs you would see with cystic fibrosis. So for your question, this is one of the most common adult onset immunodeficiencies. She has recurrent strep pneumo, sinusitis, bronchitis, pneumonia, bronchiectasis, pus in her airways, and sinusitis, and her IgG, IgA, and IgM are all low, and you get to pick her problem. Correct. It's common variable immunodeficiency, one of the most common immunodeficiencies, recurrent strep pneumo. The treatment is replace the immune globulin. Okay, so whenever you find someone with bronchiectasis, you have to wonder, do they have cystic fibrosis? Do they have alpha-1 antitrypsin? Do they have any other strange syndromes? Or they may have had aspiration, which damaged their lung permanently. They may have ABPA if they're asthmatic. Uh, they may have had a bad case of measles or whooping cough pertussis that damaged their lung. Most of the time, you never know which caused the bronchiectasis, but mycobacterium loves to follow bronchiectasis and other bugs that we're going to talk about soon. Okay, now, for your question, um, this person has a ground glass pneumonia with some bronchospasm wheezing adult onset, and it's an atypical pneumonia bug and we haven't mentioned it yet. So of the three atypical bugs, which one's left? Right, chlamydia pneumonia, which has been renamed chlamydia file pneumonia. And what is your treatment of choice? Hold that thought, we're going to get to it. But I want you to think about the wheezing and bronchospasm in the adult is a common scenario with this. Now, what are the three treatments of atypical pneumonias? Quinolones, macrolides, and doxy. Um, this is my opinion based on my experience in literature. If it's Legionella, Levaquin is the drug of choice, although Azithra would work, and you can combine it with Rifampin. For Mycoplasma, Azithro is the drug of choice, but there's other options. Chlamydia, I like to use doxycycline, but again, other options out there, okay? 
nobody really has done back to back as much on that. Now all three of those drugs get good alveolar macrophage levels and epithelial lining fluid right where you want it to go in the lungs, right? Okay, so um, for your question, we have a guy with a chronic pneumonia for a month. He has red spots on his trunk called hoarder spots, and he has hepatosplenomegaly. What do you think he has? So far, nobody has ever guessed the answer with those three choices. Now, when I give him the fourth one, the answer jumps out at you. So what's the fourth qu clue? That's his pet. So what's he got? Huh? Psittacosis. He has chlamydia cetacei. He has psittacosis. And remember the big liver spleen, the hoarder spots, the bird exposure. Okay, so... Chlamydia cetacei. Now, for your question, we have four men playing poker in the kitchen, cats giving birth in the corner of the room, all get pneumonia, one gets endocarditis, culture negative. It's associated with the sheep giving birth, and when the placenta comes out, plumes fill the room, but it's more common with sheep giving birth, and uh, it's also a bioterrorism agent. So, good guess. It's Coxiella burnetti or Q fever. It also can mimic psittacosis with a big spleen with a subacute presentation. Okay? All right. And they like to use quinolones, rifampin, doxycycline kind of drugs. Okay. For your question, this kid is um, coughing severely and he winds up with a conjunctival hemorrhage and his dad has the same thing and coughs so hard that he broke his rib. What do you think? Bordetella pertussis is the likely cause, which gives you ground glass pneumonia. And um, we are susceptible, and your vaccine only lasts in adulthood three years. And so you're probably going to be getting it again, okay? And despite all the decreases in vaccine preventable illnesses, pertussis has been a real challenge. And you can get it in your 20s as well as in your child and teen years and it's been blipping up steadily since the 90s and if you look at three studies looking at coughs lasting more than two weeks a fourth of the time it's due to bordetella pertussis which is now in our respiratory panel what is the treatment for bordetella pertussis macrolides bactrim and quinolones but usually it's in kids so you don't see much quinolones used in kids but in adults you can use those three drugs Okay, the dog is sick. The dog has kennel cough and should have been vaccinated for it. And the dog dies of pneumonia. And now the immunosuppressed human taking care of the dog has a pneumonia. So what causes kennel cough? It's Bordetella bronchoseptica. And we've had three cases in cancer patients and presented it. And they all had dogs and even vaccinated so it isn't a hundred percent okay okay this kid has inspiratory strider for your question and um, has the positive thumbprint sign on lateral x-ray and the word begins with the letter e epiglottitis and the bug is haemophilus influenza very good okay we have a right middle lobe infiltrate we have no spleen, septic shock, strep pneumo is found in the sputum, and the hands and feet turn black and need amputation. What is the name of that syndrome? That is correct. It's purpura fulminans, which occurs with Neisserman ingidity, strep pneumo, and a few other bugs, especially with no spleen, okay, from DIC vasoconstriction distally. Now, remember the respiratory quinolones for the pneumococcus, not usually Cipro. Okay, we have a COPD patient who has um, a pneumonia and exacerbation, and he has a gram-negative coccobacilli, and it's the second most common cause of community-acquired pneumonia with strep pneumo being one. What do you think is number two? That is correct. Which type is it? non typable very good and then what's number three 
Laurexella cateralis. Very good. Okay, so remember, Haemophilus loves damaged airways. That's your mucociliary escalator, getting particles out of your lungs and airways. And when you get a viral infection, it denudes the cilia. And there's three bugs that like to follow viral pneumonia, whether it's flu or anything else. What are those three bugs? Staph aureus, strep pneumo, and Haemophilus influenza. Thank you. Very good. Those are the three bugs. So this person has hospital-acquired pneumonia, and the gram stain shows this. So what's your bug? Hospital-acquired pneumonia? Pseudomonas, you know, enterobacter, all that stuff, right? So that's pseudomonas. And this person, um, for your question, had a ERCP done going into their bile ducts. And unfortunately, the scope caused a bug because it wasn't adequately clean to get into their GI tract. They had a history of biliary cancer. And now they go into septic shock, wind up on the ventilator, and they're growing in their blood a bacteria that's resistant to all drugs except uh, tigacycline and colistin. So what are they growing? CRE is the correct answer. We used to call it KPC, but it's called CRE, and we have very limited choices for it associated with contaminated scopes, but you can also get it other ways. Okay, now I want to give you um, a scenario where a bone marrow patient, he's 60 days out, he gets a viral pneumonia, he's now in your unit with septic shock, hypoxic fever, on CAT scan, he has this nodular consolidation, and it cavitates within six days. So your diagnosis is necrotizing pneumonia. So what causes necrotizing pneumonia after a viral illness, most likely? That is correct. There's his, gra his nodular consolidation. There it is cavitating in six days, and there it is cavitating a month later, trying to heal up. And he has Staph aureus, which could be MRSA. And what's the virulence factor? It's called PVL, which stands for Pantin Valentine Leukocidin, which necroses the lungs. And if it's in the skin and soft tissue, it necroses that. And notice this. If the staph is PVL positive, your mortality is five times greater. In my opinion, the guy survived because we gave him steroids plus the antibiotic Zyvox but nobody in the literature says steroids are indicated. But because of that massive inflammation, it almost, you know, kills you, okay? If the bug doesn't kill you, the inflammation can. Okay, so remember the community-acquired MRSA may be susceptible to quinolones and clinda, unlike the hospital one. And then the doxybactrim are equal, but of course with severe infections, you have to decide Vanco or Linezolid Zyvox. Okay, so the guy survives. He comes back three years later for your question. He's got another viral illness. We know he has chronic bronchiectasis because damaged lungs. So there's his sinusitis, and there's his bronchiectasis. So we send a sputum culture, and what are you expecting to possibly grow in a person with years of bronchiectasis, which colonizes their dilated bronchi? Pseudomonas. So he grows multi-drug resistant pseudomonas, and we wind up giving him inhaled colistin. We gave him azithromycin, and he did great. And why did you think we gave him azithro, which is not in the books, but I have a reason for it. And it's not because it gets rid of inflammation like steroids. It's because they use it a lot in cystic fibrosis patients, and what happens is it makes the non-mucoid virulent pseudomonas grow and so if you're going to be chronically colonized with pseudomonas, you might as well be colonized with a non-virulent mucoid pseudomonas. Okay, so that was the reasoning behind that. Uh, look it up if you don't believe me. Okay, uh, what are the bugs with necrotizing pneumonia besides MRSA? Gram negatives, anaerobes, and occasionally strep pneuma. So when you have a necrotizing pneumonia, think of that, right? Okay. We have a Hodgkin patient, fever, cough, shortness of breath. The key point is she's been on chronic steroids, and we just tapered them. And she has clean lungs, baseline, now ground glass, and the Gamori methanamine silver stain is positive, so she has PCP, pneumocystis carinii pneumonia. 
and the key was the tapering steroids, the higher mortality in non-AIDS cancer patients, and the less organisms on BAL. So remember, which group gets it? Lymphomas, Hodgkin's, non-Hodgkin's, CLL, brain tumors on Decadron, and transplant. Okay, for your question, we have a patient with lymphoma, steroids, cough, shortness, breath, hypoxic, PCP is on the bronch, ground glass, and we also found this bug, that's owl's eye inclusions and intracytoplasmic inclusions. CMV, that is correct. Okay, for your question, we have a promyositic leukemic, progressively short of breath, winds up on the ventilator, and lungs baseline look fine. Now they look terrible, and you have to pick which drug caused it, and pharmacy can help you. Do not say bleomycin because the patient has promyositic leukemia. It's the differentiation syndrome due to ATRA, all transretinoic acid. For your question, what's the likely cause of this x-ray in an immigrant to the United States? Tuberculosis, and there's the lung with tuberculosis. Now, this person in a chronic cavity developed an aneurysm right there eroding into a blood vessel. They died of asphyxiation with blood in their airways, and it turns out right there was an aneurysm. What's the name of that aneurysm that develops in a cavity, whether it's TB or something else? You are correct. It's Rasmussen's aneurysm. That's what killed the gentleman, okay? All right. What pattern is this, which I have not covered yet? Okay, what kind of seed does that look like? Cherry, mango, millet. Okay, so that's a millet seed, so we call that miliary pattern, which we think of, of course, tuberculosis, but not always. Here's a guy, bladder cancer, getting BCG installation. He has what looks to be ground glass pneumonia, he's hypoxic, coughing, short of breath, and lo and behold, he's got millet seeds in his lung. So what did he get? BCGosis, and what's the bug that we make BCG out of? Attenuated what? M. bovis, which is, guess what, in the MTB complex based on the Runyon classification. Okay, this looks miliary, but it's a little bigger than a millet seed, and the guy's from Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, so he has histo. So this guy was getting worse nodules in bone marrow transplant, and they're getting more frequent in the Bronx negative, so we did an open lung bias. We found histo, and we gave him vori instead of itra, and we melted him away and he went to transplant. So that's how you diagnose histo when you have to. Okay? And there's his case. Now, other things give you a miliary pattern. Sarcoid does whatever TB can do. Now, if you see an African-American female with this rash with fullness in her hilar lymph nodes and a rash on her legs, you want to think of sarcoidosis and then that rash is called erythema nodosum, known as Lofgren syndrome. Now, if you have an ulcer in your palate, you biopsy it, it shows granulomas, no cancer. They have holes in their lungs, cavitary nodules, biopsy that. You see granulomas, no cancer. And then finally, their kidneys are starting to go south. What do you think they have? They have Wegener's granulomatosis, and you're going to order what test? The C. anca is correct. Okay, I have a guy on chronic steroids with a big nodular pneumonia, and he has sulfur granules, gram-positive filamentous rods, modified acid fast positive, so he has nocardiosis, correct, nocardiosis, modified acid fast positive, combo therapy for 6 to 12 months. Okay, what if the lab says his bug has modified acid fast, but it's not nocardia, and then on further questioning, he's been around baby horses. And he has a cavitary pneumonia, so we have to think of rhodococcus equi. It affects AIDS patients, immunosuppress, equi for equestrian horse, okay, so rhodococcus equi. Okay, Hodgkin's patient fever cough improves with steroids, and it's only in the proximal lungs. What is your diagnosis? It's radiation pneumonitis because they radiate the mediastinum with Hodgkin's disease, so the treatment is steroids. 
Okay, this person ever since birth have these growths coming in their airways and they have to laser them. What do you think they have? And the pulmonary guys doing the laser have to wear special masks so they don't catch it. And he caught it from his mother during birth. It's HPV and he has tracheal, bronchial, human papilloma virus. Okay, this person shows up with septic shock, wide mediastinum, pleural effusion that's hemorrhagic. You tap it, it shows a gram positive rod, and immediately the FBI is called. What do you think they have? They have pulmonary anthrax, is correct. Okay, you decide you want to go camping in the four corner states. Do you know what those are? There they are, four corners. They meet right there, so you're out west. And unfortunately, you notice in the bushes and in the trees, there's these rodents. So you decide to go in the cabin. And unfortunately, they're in the wall of the cabin. And then, unfortunately, you develop a severe pneumonia with a 70% mortality. What did you get from the rodents? And there's an outbreak right now in Washington State. It's named after a virus, or excuse me, a river in China, the Hanta virus. Now, there's two kinds, the pulmonary syndrome and the renal syndrome. This is the pulmonary syndrome, and um, it's named after the Hantan River in China. So Hanta virus likes to affect 20-year-olds uh, who are exposed to the rodents, and it's usually out west. We did have a case in Florida in 19, uh, I think, 92, associated with Hurricane Andrew tearing up the place, and then the rodent population increased. Notice our one case in Florida. Otherwise, it's a pretty much out west kind of thing, but other states do show it periodically. Okay, Martha's Vineyard, famous place to go off Massachusetts. The grass is high now in the summer, so you get out your bush hog. Unfortunately, these are in the grass, and they get chopped up, and then you get pneumonia. So you probably caught what? Pneumonic tularemia. Okay, remember, it's in the Midwest mostly, and then occasionally up in the Northeast. All right, so this is called a ground squirrel, and that is called a prairie dog, which some people use as pets. So you're around these animals, and your cat specifically was catching mice out west or around these animals, and the cat dies. You bury the cat, and you get pneumonia. So what do you have? You have pneumonic plague, Yersinia pestis, as opposed to bubonic plague, okay? All right, and remember, it's, in, it's indigenous in those animals out west, as you can see here. And here you can see the prairie dog and the ground squirrels out in that area, okay, which occurs every year. Now, three pneumonias from Southeast Asia. Uh, during the Vietnam War, a lot of helicopters, okay? So when you're landing on a rice paddy, it stirs up the dust, and then you get a cavitary pneumonia. So what could you get? By the way, this bug is now in Guatemala, Central America, and other places, it's not just in Southeast Asia, and it's concerning because it could make it into the United States. We had a case here, and they presented it at ID Week. So what do you think they had? They had meliodosis, Burkholderi pseudomelii, okay? And that's a bacteria, of course. Southeast Asia, you're eating crabs, and you have hemoptysis, second leading cause of hemoptysis worldwide, TB's number one. And there's your cavity in your lung, and there's a big old egg from your sputum. So give me the name of the lung fluke. It's Paragonimus westermani, so we treat it with Praziquantrel. Okay, Southeast Asia AIDS patient CD420 has uh, pneumonia, molluscum-like skin lesions disseminated all over the body. And the yeast phase looks like this in a macrophage, and the mold phase is a red pigmented uh, mold. So what do you think he has? Right, he has Penicillium arnefiae, which has been renamed what? I forgot, so you'll have to look it up, okay? But the Marnefii stayed there, okay? 
Now, this kid has near drowning, drowning, who can develop ARDS. And now, a week later, they have nodular pneumonia and brain abscesses. So they got steroids, antibiotics, and then this happened. So what do you get from the water on near drowning? Taloromyces. Thank you. Taloromyces or Taloromyces marnefii. Thank you for the correction. Okay, so what do you think this person has that's found in the water from drowning, especially fresh water? Uh, so that is Cetosporium and rarely Aspergillus, but other bugs found in water could cause a pneumonia. And then finally, remember, most likely thing to kill you is not a ro roller coaster accident, a shark attack, a lightning strike, a plane accident, a bike accident, a fire, drowning, crossing the street, falling down. It's going to be flu and pneumonia in the world of infectious diseases. So that's why this topic is so important. Thank you.